if you have a, an opinion uh, that does not uh, necessarily agree with the that of the platform, uh, you will note you will not be able to speak it, or you will uh, not be able to speak it on that platform. So, uh, one of the questions that I think people should be asking is, do we really have access to a more, more diverse set of opinions if everyone is on the same censored platforms? And here we get again. So um, one of the things that I do is I do a show called Freedom Decrypted, and basically it, it's, it's, a, it's, like a, it's actually a radio show, podcast, video show. Um, there's, it, it, it does air on a handful of radio stations, um, but it's primarily online at freedomdecrypted.com. And in order to get this show, now I've done a, I've done a number of years in radio, and uh, so this is a little bit different than what I'm used to. But I've never I've not had a studio uh, for video until basically like a year ago or so, and I figured out how to make this all work with free software, and uh, learned how to uh, over the course of a year. Um, get off of those centralized platforms. So the show doesn't, it's not on Facebook, it's not on YouTube, it's on, it's using totally uh, either decentralized or self-hosted uh, solutions. So some of the things that I, I picked up, um, some of the things that I discovered in doing this were, it actually gets very expensive if you try and put together a show um, uh, using all of the, the good stuff. <laughs> Um, there's probably about five thousand dollars worth of equipment, but you could do it for a lot less depending on what you're trying to what your aim is. Um, you don't necessarily have to pick a thousand dollar camcorder, or a three hundred dollar uh, HDMI capture card, or fifty dollar headphones, or you know spend a thousand dollars on like arms and things like that. Um, that's some of the things that you know you, you probably do. But some of the things you would probably need are like a green screen if you're going to do. Uh, you don't really even need that technically. Um, you get some banners or something like that you can do. Um, and you don't necessarily need to do like uh, XLR is basically like um, uh, the better the better stuff is, is got XLR cables for it. You might need to solder that. Um, but none of that's really necessary. The things that you probably want are like the camera and the tripod. Um, you might want to get some blankets, cheapo blankets. That's actually how we do our sound, our sound uh, I don't want to say soundproofing, but um, uh, it basically makes the audio better. Um, but some of the things you probably do want to get are like if you if you do if you do get a camera recorder, uh, a good HDMI capture card because the cheaper ones are garbage. Um, all right, I'm gonna. You're also probably gonna want to get a mixer of some kind. Um, you don't necessarily need a mixer, but um, if you're doing kind of audio, it's it's good to have a good sound, good quality microphone. Um, there's a lot of microphones out there that are they're just garbage that are under like three hundred dollars. Um, but if you get a couple three three hundred dollar microphones, you, you can do a pretty good job of. of Pretty professional stuff, um, without a lot of the other stuff. Um, so one of the one of the ways you do a show, um, some some sort of streaming video show, is with a program called OBS. Um, OBS Studio is uh, stands for Open Broadcaster Software, and this is basically the major application to do any kind of streaming uh, video streaming on. Like you, well, a lot most of the time people do it on YouTube, but you don't necessarily need YouTube for that. And I'm going to go into that a little bit. Um, it's per it's fairly easily installed on uh, your major distributions. If you're on like a Debian-based distribution, it's just a matter of doing sudo apt-get, uh, or so, I'm sorry, sudo add apt repository, ppa uh, colon obs projects forward slash obs dash studio, and then apt-get update and apt-get install obs dash studio. And then I'll actually give you the latest version of it as well, and I believe updates as well um, when they come out. So um, one, of the, one of the ways you get around not having to uh, use YouTube or Facebook uh, to stream video is using something uh, called a relay server and you set up your own relay server and basically what this is is uh, instead of connecting your uh, OBS to YouTube or Facebook you can connect it to uh, this basically relay server that operates out on uh, like a co-located server or a virtual private server and um, that can actually relay to other servers like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Twitch and things like that if you wanted to set it up that way. Um, and you, you may, even if you have your own server set up like this, you may still want to do that in order to 
gain eyeball, eyeballs basically more of as a marketing tool as opposed to a, I'm relying on YouTube. If they decide I can't say something and they shut me down, that's it for my show or whatever I'm trying to do. Um, one, of the, one of the programs um, that I have set up, for example, with our setup is called Ant Media Server. And this basically uh, is just, it, like I said, that's, this is the part that enables you to relay, but you can actually also do the same thing with just a stock Nginx, or not, I shouldn't say stock configuration, but an Nginx configuration. You don't necessarily need to do uh, Ant Media. It's more like a, uh, adds a pretty user interface to it. Um, but it does have certain things built into it, like um, Facebook, YouTube, and it does add a pretty user interface to enter um, uh, the, all the live streaming stuff that you would you would need in order to get it working. Um, mm, all right. So um, the main thing you need to get started uh, with OBS is uh, a, some sort of video and audio stream. I guess you could do it with just an audio stream, um, although I don't know what happens with the video at that point. Um, I do more of a video show myself, so it's, and then later we extract the audio from it for like a podcast format, um, although you can download the video as well. Um, and the show that I do is a live show, so you tune in at uh, five, five to seven on, no, five to eight on Saturdays, um, and it would be just like if you went to YouTube or whatever and, and tried to access the show. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy to actually use OBS and I've had people tell me it's hard and I'm not quite sure why they think it's hard to use and it may just be that it used to be harder to use um, than it is currently, but these were also less technical people. Um, but basically it's just a matter of clicking on a little plus arrow on the screen. Uh, if you look at under where it says scenes and um, if, you, if you click that little plus arrow, you create a scene, and then in order to add audio or video, you can click the little plus arrow under where it says sources. And what this does is um, you, can, you can switch in between scenes. So for example, you can go from, in, in my example, I have a live uh, scene where it says no signal at the moment, but if there was a uh, HDMI camera uh, hooked up to this at that point um, and all turned on, it would actually show, the. you can actually see a little bit of the video of what w what's normally there. It's basically a, uh, there's a green screen and there's an image behind it of uh, Keene, uh, which is the town that I run the show out of. And then um, uh, there's like usually two people standing, sitting in on the on this show. And you would see that normally under a live scene. But if you click on Firefox scene, it would then uh, show basically a browser. You might have seen that if you've ever watched any kind of like YouTube personalities or whatever. They often will switch or uh, maybe a game um, if you're into gaming. Uh, watching that kind of thing. Um, so this is fairly common stuff. It's not that hard to use, really. Um, it's mostly just a matter of uh, switching between scenes, adding the right video feed, and that's just that's about it. Um, let's see here. Okay, so um, now the one thing that you do have to set up is uh, the server, the relay server. And so basically, um, there is there's a setting, uh, preferences, and then you go to stream, you enter your server uh, address, and this is this is the address with the Ant Media server that I've got set up here. Um, you select custom. If you didn't select custom, you would usually select like YouTube or Facebook or whatever, I believe. And then you'd enter what's called a key, and that's just basically requires authentication in order to stream to your server. Um, so um, then uh, there's some other settings here that you'd, you'd want to set up. Um, it's you want to adjust the output. Um, so basically, um, you know, select what format. To, this is actually, let's see here, this is actually to do the, to record the video as opposed to just do the live streaming. Um, so if you want to actually record the videos that are, you're live streaming, now that can also be done on Ant Media Server too automatically. I don't do it that way. I do it so that it just records automatically to the system that's uh, initiating the, the initial stream. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory, I feel like. Um, the encoders, uh, X264, um, I will say that, like, if you try to do, like, VP9 or something like that, you might, I don't even know if you can really do that, to be honest, because um, I'm not entirely sure that, at least not with the version I've got, um, that the encoding is, I think it's all done in software, and the X264 is done in hardware, and I don't know, uh, it takes a really long time to actually do the encoding. I believe there's, unfortunately at this point you can't really do it um, with VP9, but you might be able to now that like a year has passed and some of that, maybe there's more hard work in encoding support if you have a newer system or something along those lines. Um, so, yeah. 
Um, then um, if you have a green screen, there's one other thing you're probably going to want to know about, and that's something called a chroma key. Um, basically, it's just telling uh, the OBS software um, what your green screen color is in order to replace that green color with whatever picture or video it is that you want to display in the background. Um, again, this is not something you necessarily need to do. Um, if you just have, if you don't have a green screen, you know, you, you don't really need to do that. Um, now, there's one other thing that you can uh, do to make yourself yourself look more, a little bit more professional if you're doing some sort of show, and that's to use a little presentation uh, clicker. So, basically, something I don't have here and I could have brought, but um, then you wouldn't necessarily see me clicking on my laptop. You'd just be pressing a button, and it would look a lot more professional. Um, so um, that's something that's uh, nice to have. And, and basically the way you do that is you just, it's called the hotkey. And you can select uh, the hotkey. So when I initially start the show, I press uh, one of those clicker keys. And it, that will basically tell it to go to my uh, intro screen, uh, which plays a little video that says, uh, I'm trying to think what it says. It says, uh, Freedom Decrypted is sponsored by Think Penguin and Liberty Minded, I believe is what it says. And then the next scene is the live scene. And that, uh, I just click a different button, and it goes to the live video feed. Um, so it's fairly easy to do. Um, and then to actually start streaming, uh, you, you basically hit the start streaming button on your computer. If you have a clicker, again, just program the hotkey, and you don't even have to do anything more than that. So this is a little. Uh, basically, uh, you don't see this normally in the video um, of an actual show, but this is kind of the background. This is my studio that I have set up. I've got a little monitor here so I can actually read from the screen, so you're looking at the camera, basically. Um, now, you can get a lot fancier if you get a, I'm trying to think what it's called, but um, there's like fancier setups that you, they, you know, professionals use, like a TV studio. You can get something like that. Um, apparently, you can do them kind of cheap, but I found just a, a, a monitor I had laying around where it's just fine. Um, and then the camera is actually above the monitor, so it's, it's shooting down. And you can see the green screen. And we got a couple banners for events, promotion at events. Uh, you got the lighting. You got the little microphones there. So this is, a, this is actually a, a pretty nice setup here uh, that we got. And then there's actually another camera, if you see it right there, a smaller one. And that's actually new to, my, to our setup. And basically, it's got um, uh, it just basically shows the studio before the show actually starts, so in the beginning and the end, I think that's kind of just a neat little, uh, know, it's a little, it's just a little neat thing that, that's nice. And then on the left here, um, or let's see, yeah, on the left there, um, you've got the little mixer that we've got set up. Um, so, yeah, so um, as I was saying before, there is, uh, you can actually use just cheap ho uh, Home Depot uh, moving blankets in order to improve the sound quality. Um, of your of your audio, um, and it's it's really I, I don't know exactly what they'll cost, but I think I don't know maybe like sixteen dollars a blanket. I think we got like eight blankets. Um, you may not need that, but um, if you're if you're really trying to up up it a bit, it, it's certainly a nice uh, thing to have. Um, and it's literally just a matter of hanging them on your walls. Uh, let's see here. Um, so um, now one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is uh, about where where you stream to and. You could stream, uh, you set up the Ant Media server and, or some sort of Nginx uh, relay server. And what you can do is you can either just link to that directly. Um, but what I actually did is I actually linked to a, pl uh, how do I say this? Um, there's something called Flow Player, and that's actually integrated into the website. So it's just basically the, the playback playback software for, for WebM or whatever the stream is. Actually, it's not WebM. It's uh, X264 or whatever. But um, basically, it's really not that hard. Um, there's there's uh, all sorts of different software you could do. One of the ones that's more common is WordPress. Um, just set up a WordPress blog. And that's basically what we did here is we just got basically a stock WordPress blog. And we link to different listening options. And, um, and then we do some other stuff with uh, notifications. But I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so yeah. And then um, now the, the Flow Player, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Flow Player, to be honest. So it's GPL3 licensed, but it doesn't, um, they have this little terms of in the G GPL3 that allows for additional conditions on those, uh, those terms. And it's, it's relation to uh, the name of the software. Uh, and it, it's being abused. So they're basically saying if you want to use this in production, uh, commercially, you have to license their software, which isn't really the case of the GPL version 3, but 
because those terms that it allows to be added, the additional terms, uh, they're presenting it that way. You can modify the software if you want, and I actually went and hacked on that, and that's a little bit more work. But basically what happens is on the video itself, they basically are saying you have to show the Flow Media logo, and if this big Flow Media logo is actually in every single one of your videos, it obstructs the video, and it totally makes the software useless. Um, so what I did was I just made a modification to it, a slight modification to it, and shrunk the size of the logo, and I turned it into a GIF, basically. So now it goes away after a few seconds, and I've technically complied with the terms of the licensing, and I haven't paid their commercial licensing uh, nonsense, and I don't necessarily have an issue with contributing to, and I definitely encourage people to contribute to free software projects, but when a company goes out of the way to basically manipulate people like this, I totally advocate for people not complying, or complying but not actually uh, giving them their, the money. Um, so none of this was actually decentralized, this was all self-hosted, self um, but there is a way to do decentralized and distributed uh, distribution of your video. So there's something called library. Um, it's sort of similar to BitTorrent, uh, IPFS, and YouTube all in one. It basically combines all of those. And unlike these other options, library, um, besides being decentralized and distributed, it also, it doesn't do live video, but it does make it so that you can discover video like YouTube. And it also has a minus monetization mechanism built right into it through uh, basically a like cryptocurrency they called library credits and they're they're relatively easy to get and the, the benefit of this is you can contribute to uh, basically any videos uh, the producers of any videos that you might want to, to do that um, you can you can do that with a credit card and, and this is basically as you can see on the screen this is actually we have we actually don't have our show videos yet on library, because I'm still working on getting that set up so it submits it automatically. But um, what you can actually, do, there's something called uh, YouTube Connect, I think it's called. And basically it will allow you to uh, automatically sync between YouTube and library. So if you are publishing to YouTube, it would also automatically publish to library as well if you wanted to set that up. Um, and that's how these videos basically got on on our Freedom Decrypted stream. <laughs> it's because they're just basically, there were a few videos that we uploaded previously. Uh, to YouTube that d were not specifically show videos, but some of these videos, uh, clips basically, were presented in the Freedom Decrypted show. Um, because I do like to show like demos and uh, various demos, not hopefully too long, because it's mostly a talk show that I do, but um, certain things like uh, Sigil, if anybody is familiar with that, it's a Doom, uh, it's a continuation of Doom basically, and uh, like the original classic Doom. And so I did a short video of that demoing that, and it's one of the few games that there's a complete set of source code on it for, for Linux and free software operating systems. So you can actually natively play this uh, Doom, but you can also play this new version of Doom created by uh, some of the original developers. It's not, I don't think it's official, um, it's official, but it's, it's the same developer basically, or one of the developers who created the original Doom and a bunch of other popular titles. So I thought that was kind of cool, and that's that you can, and you can actually link to, you can link to library basically through the open web without actually having library installed too. Um, and that is basically uh, through speech, that's S-P-E-E -E dot C-H. And so we actually do that. So as you can see here, um, there's, it's just, if you actually enter the address HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash SPE dot CH forward slash at Freedom Decrypted uh, and you hit enter, um, you will actually see what you would be able to access through library. Uh, it's obviously not decentralized in that sense, so that could be censored. But if you open up library directly and access at Freedom Decrypted, because that's the that's basically the the library channel. It's kind of like a YouTube channel uh, that can't be censored. So that's really cool. Um, getting library credits, like I said, is actually fairly easy. And I actually I, I feel like I have purchased library credits before, but um, I'm not entirely sure that I did. So library credits are actually pretty easy to get because you can when you install the app, you actually like get credits. I think just for installing the app in and of itself. But there's also like other things you could do to get credits, like uh, besides mining too. So it's not even like hard to get credits. Um, but you can also buy credits easily through, um, I have used Changely before, which is why I'm, I'm mentioning it. Changely makes it really easy to basically convert cryptocurrencies, one cryptocurrency, uh, from one cryptocurrency to a another cryptocurrency. Um, 
but I've never actually used it to buy cryptocurrencies with a credit card, but apparently you can do that. Um, so that's one way to, to get cryptocurrencies, and it doesn't necessarily require you to go to a vending machine or, um, I don't know, buy them off your friends or whatever. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool. Um, now, I wanted to talk a little bit about marketing the show um, or your, your channel or whatever, whatever it is you're trying to do exactly. Um, and one of the ways to do that is through Mastodon. Um, it's, Mastodon is a decentralized social networking uh, platform, I guess you could call it, um, except that it's, because it's federated, you have, a, you have thousands of servers set up. And you can either set up your own server, which I will have to say is not something that's easy to do, and it's kind of like, the directions apparently are not that good. I haven't done it myself, but um, somebody else I'm working with set up a, uh, set up a server for us. And he was like, he's just pulling his hair out, trying, he knows what he's doing, he's a, he's a system admin. And it just, it, I guess the software it's based off of is not that great, um, or dependent on some of the dependencies. And so it's just, it's a, it's a hair rolling thing. But fortunately, um, there are a lot of servers already out there set up. So you can actually just join any one of them. And if one, you know, one server is run by a socialist and you're a libertarian, well, you know, don't join the socialist <laughs> server because if they want to block you, they could. But you could join another server uh, for libertarians and magically the problem goes away. And you could do that vice versa, obviously. Um, so I didn't want to be in that situation of you know uh, being blocked or uh, kicked off of a particular node. So that's why we set up our own server. Not that I think that we have uh, I have that much to say that's going to be likely to get us blocked from YouTube or you know any other platform anyway. But um, should that should somebody not like something I say, like I don't know, YouTube is horrible, for example, and YouTube doesn't like that. Uh, well, doesn't really matter. So. All right, so this is, um, now, uh, like I said, Mastodon is kind of like Twitter, um, but again, uh, not centralized, so there's nobody who can kick you off. Um, this is, uh, on, the, on the right here, you can see this is a little, I'm trying to think, this is, this is, this is Fetty Lab, I believe, and um, Fetty Lab is basically a application for Android um, in, uh, they can get from, F-Droid, F-Droid store, which is, for those who aren't familiar with F-Droid, it's basically, uh, uh, I think it's called Google, I think, I think Android plays, calls their um, app store Google Play, and it's basically you know, a Google Play alternative that only has free software, um, so that's kind of cool, and basically it allows you to post your Twitter-like toots, they call it toots on, on uh, Mastodon, and so I toot whenever I, a show is about to go live, or a show has, um, uh, been concluded and we post the video, it actually set up, uh, there's also something called, uh, I think it's called AutoToot, and basically that will integrate, it's a plugin that integrates with WordPress, and so it'll automatically, uh, whatever I post to the blog will automatically get posted to Mastodon. And you don't have to be on the same Mastodon instance as somebody else um, in order for them to get your toot. So, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, let's see here. So um, another thing that's kind of cool is you can actually embed using an iframe your uh, your toots, <laughs> I guess if that's how you want to phrase it, uh, on your site. So um, that's not too hard to do, um, and it's kind of cool. So people will see like what you're tooting even if they're not on Mastodon yet. Um, we actually link to a Mastodon server, not the one that we've got set up, but another one, um, somebody else's Mastodon instance. And so you can actually sign up right on the site. So if you've never actually used Mastodon, it's not that really, it's not really that hard to join a Mastodon instance. It's no different than joining Twitter or some other, you know, proprietary platform. Um, uh, let's see here. So um, now there's, there's also other ways to market, and these are probably ways to market like a show you've, probably never really, you probably wouldn't think of. Um, email is actually still one of the biggest players in terms of, it's something that everybody has. So uh, marketing people are gonna be like, uh, duh, um, you know, use email. But um, it, it's not something that I think your, uh, your typical YouTuber would think of. Um, and it's something that I thought of because I'm like, well, how can I market a show that, you know, is 
<laughs> if I'm not on YouTube, if I'm not on uh, Facebook, and f by the way, Facebook is terrible for marketing, um, you know, how do I go about doing it? So, well, email. You can set up your own email server, and I know a lot of people are kind of like, oh, but it's so hard, and spam, and all this other stuff, and I want to say um, it, it can be a little challenging, but at the same time, there's actually scripts nowadays that make it really pretty simple. Um, if you haven't used I read mail or mail in a box, um, I would check it out. Um, basically, both of these projects make it almost idiot proof to set up. It's it's really not that hard. Um, you can find tutorials online that will basically you know s spin up a Linode instance or on some other VPS, uh, you know whatever your favorite VPS provider is, and run the script. And it will basically ask you for everything you need to know. It'll set it up. Um, there are, might be a few things DNS wise that you need to do too. Um, I think the directions usually will give, uh, if you have a decent set of directions anyway, you'll actually, um, and, and if anybody has any questions actually about this, you can always email me, chris at freedomdecrypted.com, um, but I can email you, I can let you know what the good directions are that actually work. Um, but it'll explain how to set up the DNS, and let me continue. So um, the DNS stuff is actually the tricky part, I think, and in order to comply with spam and like so the Gmail actually accepts your emails and you don't get blacklisted and stuff, there's certain things you want to do with the D, uh, DNS. And there's a tool, um, there's, there's probably more than one, but um, one that I've used recently. Now, I already have uh, mail servers for thinkpenguin.com, which is another company that, this company, I'm the CEO of that company and founder, and basically we sell computers and accessories and things like that for Linux and free software. Yeah, <laughs> somebody in the audience just uh, held up uh, one of our laptops. Um, but um, we have a mail server set up for that, and I've never used any kind of uh, test program to see, how, you know, where do we fall on the spam ranking, basically, like how friendly is our. Now, our mail servers for them were, I think they were a 6 out of 10, and they never had, I've, I've never encountered anybody who hasn't gotten our mail. But nonetheless, um, when I set up a mail server for uh, Freedom Decrypted, um, especially because I wanted to set up a newsletter software, um, as well, I wanted to make sure that our emails uh, actually got to got to the people who they were intended to get to. So I used a little uh, web service called mail-tester.com, and it worked great. And uh, it basically helped me narrow down like the little things that would be a potentially an issue maybe with some email providers uh, when it comes to spam and you know blocking blocking your your newsletters or your emails from getting through. So um, basically now when you know, uh, we send out an email, um, it passes right through Google and other providers' uh, anti-spam uh, systems. So one of the things, uh, one of the things that you, you also are probably going to want to do is set up something called MailTrain. Um, basically, if anybody's ever done an email marketing before, a lot of different entities and organizations use something called MailChimp. And so MailTrain is basically the equivalent of MailChimp, but without the uh, centralization. So you can actually, you can use services uh, like, I'm trying to think some of them that exist, but there's like basically services that offer a mail server so that your mails don't get blocked. Um, but we already set that up in the prior, presumably <laughs> uh, in the prior screen here. So we can actually just use that. And what happens is in MailChimp, in the software, in this newsletter software, um, it, you can actually just enter your SMTP server information, username and password, and it will just use that. Um, and it actually works great. Um, as you can see, we've, I've got mailing lists for a bunch of different um, uh, projects and, and things that I work on. Uh, Forkfest.party is another, uh, uh, I wanna say a conference. It's not so much a conference, but a, uh, it's a camping festival. So, um, and it's I, it's a decentralized camping festival actually. Um, so there's nobody actually in charge of it, and it's kind of cool. Um, if you if you haven't checked it out, check it out. Um, but basically, uh, a lot of tech people um, have kind of gotten together and organized it in sort of not really because there's nobody actually in charge, but a bunch of people get together, and uh, it, it's got. Uh, there's uh, the, the mailing list is brand new, so it's only got seven people subscribed as well as of that. But um, there's hundreds of people who are on like Telegram and some other platforms that are being used to organize it. And actually, that's kind of cool because we actually moved away from uh, Google Calendar in past years, and now we're on. Uh, I'm trying to think what we're using. We're using 
I'm going blank here, uh, but it's it's the popular Nextcloud Nextcloud uh, for our calendaring on that as well. So it's like there's all these different tools you can use if you're organizing events or um, you know shows or whatever to help market your show. So um, so. Yeah, so Freedom Decrypted, like I said, is uh, it's just our freedom slanted weekly tech show that I do for Berkeley people. Um, we're a talk show that covers uh, the latest tech. Uh, it's distributed decentralized systems, copyright, freedom, uh, GNU Linux, cryptocurrencies, and more. Uh, check it out. It's uh, freedomdecrypted.com. Um, questions? One of the things that, um, this is a very interesting subject to me, decentralized everything on the internet. Um, one of the things as I talk about this with people outside of the sphere of technology is, well, how can I do this myself? They don't really have an appetite to set up a server, um, a centralized service, um, like sub, um, stuff that is decentralized, like the, the um, library um, project. How would like a non-technical user get indoctrinated into something like that? Um, so library is very easy to install. It's you don't need to set up a server. It's based off of like a block. I think it's based off like a blockchain technology. So basically, once you've uploaded the video to library. Even if you shut down your instance, it's still your videos are still readily available. Um, so that's actually the easiest possible thing to use. I've, I you wouldn't have a problem as a non technical user using it. Um, it's literally just a matter of selecting an upload button once library is installed, and it doesn't matter whether you're on Linux or Windows or some other operating system. Um, it's so 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 simple. I guess the other concern is um, users installing a client who want to view, they can use the website just as effectively. Yeah, so that's correct. Um, it's literally just a matter of going to spee.ch, uh, so speech, um, and then forward slash, and then at uh, your channel. So like I said before, um, our channel for Freedom Decrypted is literally Freedom Decrypted. Um, it is cap sensitive, so I think you do have to have an F and a, uh, and a D there in Freedom Decrypted. But um, other than that, yeah, you, and we do just link to it from our website. Um, we do have a direct link and then we have a indirect link. So if you are if you don't have the library application installed, um, um, yeah. Now keep in mind that because it is, speech is a domain name and they potentially would have to censor you uh, probably if, I don't know, you were really doing something that was out there in terms of <laughs> in terms of uh, contents, possibly. Um, I don't know in terms of like domain registers, like what might be a problem. But there certainly could be there certainly uh, instances that might be an issue, or maybe even not so much out there. But like if you're doing, I don't know, like if you're doing some sort of show that's promoting piracy or something like that, um, that might be probably a good example of something that's not too controversial. But at the same time, uh, they have gone after people for. Um, on YouTube, and YouTube has shut them down, so there's nothing to say, you know, the copyright cartels won't go after a domain register if you have a domain name, and they do do that kind of thing too all the time, so certainly um, taking a look and, uh, you know, having, you know, getting people to install library is probably a, a, a good move, and keep in mind that a lot of this technology is very new and early, so it's not totally flawless, but you got to start somewhere. Um, it's not like you can you can move off a centralized platform overnight. A lot of the you know underlying technology, whether it be cryptocurrencies or uh, YouTube replacements, are still in their infancy to some degree. But to be honest, uh, library does work pretty well. Um, I would probably still right now um, self-host your videos or your audio, uh, just because. It, it's not 100% perfect. There are videos, if you try to do a search, that might not play or might not come up um, properly. Um, so, but um, I think as time goes on, you will see that it does get better. Um, I actually do know uh, Jeremy, the the developer, the main developer behind Library, and um, he's right actually out of New Hampshire uh, near me actually, and uh, he's. Yeah, I mean, they're doing a great job. I think it's it's just a matter of time. Um, I don't know if those are familiar with IPFS. Um, I might have said earlier that library was
based off IPFS, that's actually not correct. Um, I was mistaken <laughs> about that. So you, you gave an incredibly technical, low-level talk, and I think the audience really wants from you a more high-level talk. Could you tell us five years from now your utopian vision in a world without Zuckerberg and without YouTube? How do we get there? What is it like? And how, how do we get to that world? Stop using Facebook. <laughs> um, I never actually got on Facebook myself. So I'm not entirely familiar with Facebook. <laughs> um, I'm probably the only person who is not looking to get off of Facebook. So I'm, I'm probably not the best person to ask this. But certainly, I think um, people around me are getting off of Facebook now. And lots of people, and I'm talking about not even technical people, but less technical people. Um, so there's a show called Free Talk Live. And there used to be something called uh, the AMP Group, which is Advertise, Market, and Promote. And it was basically a means of people contributing money to promote the radio show. This is a syndicate, it's a major syndicated radio show. It's got like 200 uh, radio stations all across the country. It's got a couple satellites um, all over multiple continents, and it's also got an online following. And basically, um, for, for many years, um, one of the things that you got as a benefit to uh, amping was a, you got access to some sort of Facebook group, I think it was, and I think that was a, I believe that was restricted to AMP, somehow it was restricted to AMP uh, contributors or users or whatever, um, and that, uh, oh yeah, okay, so, so Ian, um, who was basically behind, he's, he's the main person on the show, main, the main co the main co-host. He runs the show, it's his baby, basically. And so he actually got off of Facebook. And for a little while, he was continuing to log in just to keep an eye on, on, on that little Facebook group. Um, and eventually he stopped. So um, it, it's, I don't think it's impossible. Um, I think it is possible. And it's just a matter of you know, putting one step in f front of the other. You know, let people know that you're not on Facebook anymore. Um, tell them where you are. Where are you on? You know, like, I will give you. I will tell you that I, I have a Mastodon uh, uh, account, and you can catch me on Mastodon. Now, it's not. It's not a Facebook replacement. Don't get me wrong. Um, but if you're on Twitter, <laughs> certainly it's a Twitter replacement. So I give out my Mastodon instance. I put it on business cards. I put it on uh, the website. I, you know, when you join, uh, if you go to freedomdecrypted.com and you click on uh, join, or I'm trying to think if it's join Mastodon. No, join Mastodon would be to actually sign up. Um, uh, I think it's follow. Follow Mastodon is what I have. Follow. I think it's like mastodon.follow or something like that. And if you click on that, um, you will be able to follow just like you would maybe a, a Twitter user. Um, and I think just by using these other alternative options and linking people to where can they get a Mastodon account, um, things like that, you, you'll quickly realize, you'll quickly find that there is a lot of people following you who you never even knew were on Mastodon. Um, and that's, that's what I actually found out. We get more people clicking on follow on the follow, not follow to Mastodon link and following us on Mastodon than we have people subscribing to the email. Now, we haven't had the email option available for very long, like maybe a week or two, but it's still like every day just about I'm having somebody click the follow for Mastodon, and that's a heck of a lot less than we've got for the, for the email. Um, so it's, it's getting popular. Um, and I know a lot of non-technical people who are on Mastodon. So if you're not on Mastodon and you're a technical person, I don't know where you've been, but <laughs> you might want to get on Mastodon. Anybody else have uh, questions? Hold on. I was just going to say, okay, okay. I was just going to say, I've used the uh, uh, the OBS Studio. Yeah. It's excellent. It hasn't failed me one time, uh, not once. The only failure is I made an error or didn't know exactly what I was doing. It is, it works so well. Uh, I just want to say that. Uh, it's, it's easy to use, everybody. Yeah, that's been my experience as well. Um, and it's, it's not like there's no learning curve to it. Um, I think there is a little bit of a learning curve to it, especially if you've never done audio or uh, video before. Um, I would say probably, though, the thing that's more complicated 
uh, was probably just getting like the mixer set up and figuring out, oh, you can't, and actually this is not even something that was, um, oh, how do I say this? Um, this was something that was should have been obvious to me, but I just didn't realize it. Uh, we had a some sort of power cable, I think, crossing an audio cable, and you can just imagine what happens, uh, even if it's shielded, if it's right next to it. And there was static and other stuff, but it was just actually setting, just getting that set up and figuring out what our audio problems were, were so much more complicated than anything that had to do with OBS itself. Um, OBS is really quite straightforward. And actually, I actually now having learned it a little bit, uh, it's actually underwhelming, I feel, in terms of in, like power and stuff. It is, it's powerful, but it's also, it's not, in, in a sense, it's not. Like there's a lot of things that OBS is not gonna do. It's, it's good at what it does do, which is, you know, live streaming. But I think as far as like actual like video editing, um, it's, it, it's not really designed for that. And it's actually something I, want, I did want to talk a little bit about um, before uh, my time ran out was other uh, solutions for like editing video. Um, there's, there's, or audio for that matter. So there's programs like OpenShot. Now I'm not that familiar with uh, KDE NLive. I know some people find that, they find that, uh, they like that better. Um, personally, I like OpenShot <laughs> and it works for me. Um, I haven't ever figured out why people like NLive. I used to feel like it crashed on me a lot and OpenShot seemed to be better, but it may just be the packaging or particular distribution or something along those lines that was uh, the issue. Um, but there's a there's different sorts of features and effects that you can use in order to create like intros uh, with OpenShot. And it's fairly easy to use. I don't know if anybody's used uh, Kino, Kino, I'm not even sure how to pronounce this, K-I-N-O, um, in, in the past, but Linux has come a long ways in terms of video editors. So there's a bunch to choose from. Um, and there's all sorts of effects, and there, you probably won't have any problems with you know creating intros or anything like that these days, um, or even just uh, you know like little promos, like if you've got a sponsor or something like that. Um, not hard at all. Um, I would say probably the only thing that I've learned is get yourself a directional mic, <laughs> and not one of these hundred dollar uh, piece of junk mics that will pick up all the room audio. Um, that seems to be the trick to getting you know decent quality audio out of your your setup. Um, um, and then um, of course there's Audacity. I, I I'm probably mentioning things that most of you probably already know, but um, Audacity uh, Audacity is good for editing audio. Um, I'm not really sure. There's much much more to say to that. It's just yeah, it's an, an audio editor, so if you need to cut and paste audio or something to that effect, it, it works great. Does anybody else have any questions? I say in terms of distribution, have you looked at things like PeerTube and other federated services? Um, I'm actually, I'm aware of PeerTube. I'm not familiar with it. I haven't personally looked at it really. Um, I have, uh, my partner has looked at it more in depth than I have. Um, I certainly know he's excited about it. I don't know how it compares to library or what the differences are though really. Um, but certainly it's something that you probably should be looking into if you're interested in decentralized solutions. Uh, to problems, it is it is one of those. I know it's it goes down that path basically. So, yeah. Does anybody else have questions or comments? Uh, so, from what I understand, Macedon is a uh, federation of servers. All right. So, uh, what's this? If I, you know, I'm a persona non grata. People don't like me. They don't want to hear what I have to say. Uh, so I run my own Macedon server. Where I uh, post to is that is that how it works? Uh, you know, I can I run my own server. And I can post to that. Yeah. So okay. So yes. Yes. Uh, so the next part, I guess, what's to stop other? You know, most users they get their data from another Mastodon server. So what's to stop those servers from uh, not playing fair by the protocol and just uh, ignoring me? Okay. So. That's actually a good question. So there's actually censorship in the some sense built into uh, the Mastodon network. Yeah, so it's 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 kind of along the lines of, so an individual instance can kick you off if you're 
uh, part of that instance. Um, so you do want to make sure that you're part of an instance that is not going to kick you off, or you set up your own instance. Um, right. Um, the other thing is, I think you can block uh, certain instances. So potentially, you know, if the socialists really don't like the libertarians enough, uh, or a particular in socialist instance, they could potentially. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's certainly possible. Uh, I think I don't know that when they block it will actually prevent individual users. I think the way it usually works is it'll. Oh, okay. I think we have an answer to this over here. Somebody knows more than I do. Just to answer your question, if you, okay, uh, the one as far as if you're running your own individual instance, and someone decides to block you, yes, that instance then you are not immediately discoverable by people from that instance. They can still subscribe to you, though. Yes, if... if yes, but it does give you the ability to reach the audience you want. If, you know, the people that are on that instance trust... Yeah, if the people that are on that instance trust their admin to only block things they want now, whether that's a good idea or not is another issue, but you will be reachable by everybody else. So if your ideas, you know, can get out to everyone else on the Fediverse other than that. Yeah, well, Playfair doesn't mean no moderation at all. You know, if Mastodon incentivized uh, sharing and storing just in general, you know, there's some kind of, uh, you know, scoring equation where, they, you know, this much data from a variety of other instances, I think that. So that's entirely. Yeah, it's, it's entirely based on what your instance owner decides they want to listen to. Just as if you're doing your instance and you don't want to hear things from a particular other instance, you may block them. So everybody is, every, you know, just like email. Email could say, hey, this site is spam, and you won't see messages from them. You have to trust your admins to do that correctly. Yeah, I, I will point out also just that um, this is why it's important to not everybody get on the same instance because then we just end up with another Facebook. Um, 10.30 um, Sunday at the Oracle Ballroom. I'm going to get more into the social networking aspect of this, um, how the plumbing of the Fediverse works. So this is kind of, um, yes, it's a shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, I, I would definitely encourage I would definitely encourage people to look at other, uh, go to other talks um, to learn more about some of these uh, applications I talked about. I didn't want to go into any technical detail um, on like how to set them up. A lot of it's like there's going to be tutorials out there if you have any questions about any of it. Um, given that I've already set it up and I've got links to it saved <laughs> for most of the stuff already, feel free to email me, uh, chris at uh, freedomdecrypted.com, and I'd be happy to send you links. I also have like lists of equipment and stuff that I, I use personally in the studio that's worked well with free software. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, most of the stuff is not that terribly hard. It's some of the stuff that's a little bit harder to do is like probably like if you want to have uh, your WordPress uh, post go to your well, not not so much mass zombies. That's easy. It does it automatically. If you want it to automatically upload when you upload the video, I guess is is probably going to be a little bit more complicated. Uh, because there's not a plugin to do that to say library, for example. Um, there, you can do if you're uploading to YouTube, though. Like I said, you, there is the YouTube Connect thing uh, that you can sign up for, where it'll just sync everything to library automatically. Um, I mean, it's it's not as ideal, given that you're now still dependent on YouTube, and if YouTube blocks you, <laughs> that won't work anymore. But um, if if it's if you know if you're not as controversial, then maybe uh, you know that will work fine for you for the moment um, until somebody comes out with a plugin that. You know, does it automatically? Um, I've just hacked personally. I'm just I've just basically hacked some code together to make it work on our instance, and it's not even it's not even 100 complete yet. But it's not it's not if you're if you got some coding skills, it's not that hard. I'm by far not. 
I mean, I'm, I've been coding for a very long time, but I'm by far not the, the most uh, experienced coder, I'm sure, in this room. So um, it's not that terribly difficult to basically script it to automatically upload. Um, you can just, you can probably just hack, I think, I think you can just hack on the, um, the Mastodon plugin itself to upload the video or something along those lines. Um, so, or yeah, basically because there's comments. So, so the reason it's a little bit more complicated is because there's there's comments in addition to, to the blog post, in addition to the video, and you've got to kind of align the two um, and then uh, execute a command to then upload to library. Um, but like I said, you don't really have to do it that way. You could just upload your own video manually to library or upload it manually to YouTube and then have the YouTube sync, uh, or not YouTube, I, I forget what it's called exactly, but it's, it's whatever the syncing thing is between YouTube and library, uh, you'll, you'll find it at the library. Uh, I think it's lbry.com now um, URL, but there you will see how to do that. There's directions, it's really easy. Um, it's, there is, there is some manual stuff going on that's a service, not a decentralized aspect of it. Uh, so keep that in mind. I mean, technically, you know, that could, that could potentially be cut off. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, you know, you're going to get cut off with any of these services. Um, but, you know, I mean, depending on where you go, possibly maybe somebody will want to to uh, cut you off, I don't, given that there's a libertarian behind that particular service, I kind of doubt you're gonna get cut off, but um, even if you're like a conservative or something, or I don't know, you're a piracy supporter or whatever it is, I don't think that you're gonna get censored, but there's, you never know. Um, I have seen, I have seen people say they're libertarian and then go and do stuff that is just not very libertarian-ish, so. Any other questions? Comments, thoughts? Criticisms? Ah, good question. Um, so I'm going to say go to freedomdecrypted.com and click on the follow.mastodon link <laughs> um, because I am not actually sure what my handle is. I think it's, I think it might be Mr. Do you know my handle? Okay, so it's Mr. Mr. Underscore Penguin at social.bobcall.me is my handle for Mastodon. And <laughs> shockingly, somebody in the room actually knows it, and I don't. Um, I do have quite a few followers, um, and so I've been on a little bit, a little while now, but um, yeah. Uh, my personal preference for Messaging platforms. Um, yeah, this is a good question. Um, so if we're talking about like genuinely decentralized, um, Matrix and Riot are probably the, probably the way to go, but there's still kind of the development is, you know, it's still in the works. It's still kind of beta. Um, it seems to actually work pretty well, to be honest, um, but it's, I think GBG in terms of difficulty. Um, if you are actually taking advantage of all of the encryption part encryption parts, and I don't necessarily know what the advantages are in a group chat like environment, unless you it's small enough where uh, you know, and you know everybody has their own system secured, and you don't have any infiltrators or anything of that nature, um, which is something to think about. It's one it's one of the things with active if you do any kind of activism, um, you're going to be you're going to be in a situation where, you know, if, if you're doing something in a small group, you might be able to keep it secret. But as soon as you get to any threat level of any kind to another party, we'll just say adversary, you're going to end up with infiltrators. And at that point, it's like, you know, <laughs> all bets are off. It doesn't matter how much encryption you use. It's not really going to work. Um, but it's still something I think we should all be trying to use uh, just so that those who do need it, um, and can take advantage of it will not be, uh, you know, they, they you won't be able to pick out the people who are using it, using encryption for whatever it is you don't want them to use it for. Um, and then, what am I actually using um, in the real world? Unfortunately, uh, Telegram and Telegram is is so Telegram is free software, but the back end is proprietary, uh, or the servers that you're connecting to are proprietary. So like you can be potentially shut down or cut off. It's Definitely not ideal. Now, I do believe there's a libertarian behind um, 
uh, Telegram, and I do know that Telegram is fairly decent in terms of not getting cut off. Like if you're in, say, Russia, for example, Russia had a situation where they uh, basically tried to shut Telegram down by blocking like every single IP address, and they basically they they and undermined the very internet accessibility like for major websites. <laughs> so like in their attempts to block Telegram. Um, so it certainly seems to be a fairly decent tool, especially for some groups, um, you know, that some governments may not like. Um, I know, I think China actually DDoS'd uh, the Telegram servers here with the uh, Tel, is it, I think it might have been the Telemann Square protests or something, or no, it was, it was really to Hong Kong, I think. Um, but in any event, the point is, I think they may have been somewhat successful with the DDoS attack. Um, so it may not be perfect, but it, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's certainly better than say, I don't know, uh, what is Microsoft? Does Microsoft have some sort of instant teams? Okay. Okay. I'm not even, I wasn't even thinking of that. I was thinking of some video Skype, Skype, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Um, Skype is yeah I know peer, I know Skype doesn't have peer to peer and I, that would be terrible that's definitely censored that's actually backdoored NSA kind of stuff now I believe um, yeah XMPP um, I mean XMPP can be DDoS though um, means you have centralized servers and also um, yeah I like XMPP personally but it's uh, it's a good question yeah I mean um, so one of the reasons I mean unfortunately Telegram. I don't trust Telegram to a degree because so, so they one of the things they advertise is encryption, but the problem is that their their encryption I think only works or it did only work on Android, and every phone is backdoored. So how is that supposed to work? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't necessarily think that you know there's there's malware in the software. The code is available. I think it's like GPL, maybe even three license, something like that. Um, maybe somebody else knows. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I, I know the sources are available. I know I've looked into it before because I wouldn't have installed it on my own computer otherwise. Um, but yeah. I think Matrix is the only one. I think um, Matrix is the only one that's been like audited outside of them. Audited by who? Don't know the name yeah, offhand. Some third, party. some third party. So yeah, so some third party <laughs> audited um, Matrix. It's better than yoga. That's for yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the NSA audited Matrix. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Matrix is potentially the way forward. I I just don't know. In terms of ease of use, they're supposed to add some features to it that will make it easier to use. Um, I haven't used it actually in like probably six months because it was, I, unfortunately I tried to get people using it and unfortunately there were enough people that were not that technical. It was just not, it was not working. It was not working for the group that I was using it with. And, but if you've got a more technical group, um, you, you may find that it, it works adequately. And in the future, you may find that it works adequately for less technical people. But when you're trying to deal with like GPG keys, and, and it, again, these weren't GPG keys specifically, but it, you know, public key cryptography, um, and there's no simpler solution other than checking a long you know, set of code digits and things, and you gotta be there in the room in the same place and same time and everything else, it's, it's a challenge. It's certainly, it definitely feels like something that was designed uh, at least up to this point for uh, developers and, you know, technical users, not uh, your end users, but I don't know. Any more questions, comments, thoughts, criticisms? Uh, no, I, was, I was holding back on trying to say all this, but, um, to me, this, you know, you're talking about decentralizing the web, and it sounds to me in many ways, you know, how, you know, the internet, at least everybody's, the initial 